Hey guys, I'm Gaspachian. You've seen me abusing gravity assists for fun and profit. It's only going to... well... We'll start out rehearsing what we did last episode, so for now things will stay about as bad as is. Last episode, we put up a comm satellite in a geocentric synchronous orbit with the Moon for the benefit not only of our future lunar exploration, but also for communications during low Kerbin orbit missions, as well as probings further afield. But all of that communication will be for naught if our satellites don't stay connected to the space center in turn, and to enable any semblance of reliability in uptime, we're indeed forced to put several of these layer 2 comm satellites up into orbit. I say several, when in actuality I mean exactly three. Two in visibility of the moon, and one situated on the far end of Kerbin in relation to our lovely rocky neighbor. Last episode we put up a relay that is for the longest foreseeable future destined to orbit ahead of the moon, and discussed that it would indeed have been the satellite's permanent resting spot had it not been for the simplified assumptions of the patched conix approximation in use by KSP. Following the success of that mission, we're now looking to put a relay trailing the Mun at the Lagrange 0.60 degrees behind it in its orbit around Kerbin. With two of these relays up, talking to each other and the Kerbin Space Center, we should have about, I don't know, 83% remote tech uptime for any craft with invisibility of either satellite with promises to increase that number to an even 100% once we get the third relay up into orbit. Even so, as we always like to do here at the Caspatian Space Administration, we're going to throw caution out of the window and attempt our first unmanned moon landing ahead of completing the trio of satellites that will safely shepherd our more sophisticated attempts at landing, especially those carrying a non-expandable payloads, i.e. Kerbals. For now, we reckon 83% may just be good enough, given our low stakes and eagerness for progress to commence. Touching down on a foreign celestial body would be a world first achievement beyond any thus far, if scientific value is concerned. Being able to perform propulsive landings on non-atmospheric body bodies opens up a plethora of future missions, almost more so than putting a Kerbal in space. Earlier on, we did demonstrate our ability to propulsively land on Kerbin, however, bringing it all to bear in a real mission environment will be altogether different to those earlier skips we did. To get to that point, we first need to get this satellite deployment done, of course. Just as with the previous mission, we're going to go past the Mun, grabbing a much welcomed gravity assist on the way. From there, it's a matter of adjusting the resulting post-capture parakeet to be in line with the orbit of the Mun and then, through some means, lower our apple key. In the previous mission, we opted for and managed to pull off a second Mun capture to circularize our orbit. However, for this mission we decided instead to go for a simple retrograde burn at our periapsis. We did have loads of delta-v to spare last time, and performing the adjustment both elegantly through a recapture and the brute force method of propulsive adjustment enables us to see how much savings we got from our second assist. It also rids us of two illusions, that the last mission somehow hinged on a stroke of luck to be pulled off, and that these satellites were somehow efficiently designed missions. The amount of over-engineering that could have been spared on these launchers is shameful. To rectify these wrongdoings of mine, I'll of course start designing better, leaner launchers in the future to save on both funds and shame. For this playthrough, we're going to target specific payload masses to low carbon orbit and design our missions based largely on our launchers' capabilities moving forwards. For further ease of use and convenience, these launchers will have varying configurations to carry out different sets of mission profiles, both in regards to recoverability capability, as well as providing parakey kick capabilities for more demanding missions. We'll get to that once we've actually started using those launchers. The mission at hand is nearly identical to the mission we conducted last episode, however, and of course it goes off without a hitch. 
Although we took less care for efficiency and debris cleanup, we managed to put the satellite in an orbit in phase with the MUN, from where it will be able to provide us with the requisite communications. We dub it the Gullingkambi, another one of the three roosters who would harbinger Ragnarok. Now it's time for more exciting happenings. We're going to develop and fly the first of our standardized launchers with a very novel payload. It is finally time to attempt the landing on the moon. Shown here is a test flight done in daylight since the actual launches will take place during nighttime because of inclinations and launch windows. Things I've discussed at length in previous videos. But this is our first pretty rocket, so it deserves some time in the limelight. It'll see plenty of use in future missions as well, since it's designed to be versatile with a fairly common payload capacity. And also, very importantly, it doesn't slow the game down too much during launch. The payload we're developing alongside the launcher is a rover slash sky crane combo payload with a smart transfer stage. Rovers albeit prone to flipping over, are neat with the contextual contracts added in 1.0.5, allowing us to earn extra funds and science in a pinch by driving a previously landed rover to a number of checkpoints. Sky cranes are of course the preferred way of deploying rovers in real life, and coincidentally one of the simpler deployment systems to design in KSP as well. Our first rover design will take on a new naming scheme as well, which will be followed for all of our unmanned missions. It will be called the Hornbory, or Hornblower, after one of the many fabled dwarfs of Northmere. Other probe missions will receive their names after other dwarfs, and I'll do my best not to infringe on the ones Tolkien already copied to keep things interesting and educational. As for the smart transfer stage, the idea is to fill the comms gap we're inevitably going to leave on the far side of the moon, as well as reduce the payload weight of the rover by only needing to equip it with a powerful omnidirectional antenna rather than a proper dish. The transfer stage will perform both our transmunar injection as well as our moon capture burn, but will after that be left in orbit acting as a comms relay talking to each of our Lagrange satellites with the onboard parabolic antennas and relaying data using the Omni antenna on board. With multiple rover missions headed for our neighbor, we're going to end up with a constellation of smart stages in orbit, promising near 100% uptime for any Omni antenna equipped craft within the month's SOI. That's also the reason we're going to launch more than one rover before attempting a landing, so we get some safety in redundance as far as comms go. I'm sure there are worse feelings than losing a mission because of a comms blackout only a kilometer or so from the ground, but I don't care to find out about those nor actually have to go through such a failure more times than I absolutely have to. Because things like that happen to me all the time, I assure you. But failures are not to be the main feature of this series. Surely that spot should be reserved for gorgeous space visuals. In that department, two things are to note. During test flights, I will time and again tweak Scatterer to get at that elusive blue marble look. And forgoing the photorealism I strive for in that regard, I've got a fancy new skybox on display. This one provided by Pudmund. There is nothing that explicitly states that the Kerbal system couldn't be inside of a nebula like the one shown. The unrealistic bit is simply the brightness of said nebula. We'll chalk it up to Kerbals and their probes having excellent night vision or something along those lines. But the real reason is of course, and is always going to be, eye candy. When cutting these videos, it's readily apparent that not a lot really ever happens in this game, so while you're busy looking at nothing happening, I may as well offer you a pretty backdrop to look at while taking up your time. But right as we speak about nothing happening, we're going to achieve orbit around another solid body for the first time in this space program. 
itself already quite the feat. Lacking any other rovers or smart stages in orbit, we're going to postpone the landing of this rover until further notice, opting instead to bring its siblings out to the moon to join it in its unless acted upon perpetual motion. This would again not be the case with Principia installed, where the proximity of Kerbin would quickly destabilize any orbit around the moon. Thus far I mostly touched on the drawbacks of not having any body physics around, but the honest truth is everything is so much simpler without it, which I'm very much thankful for. As such, we are now watching Hornbore 2 make its way over to Kerbin's prime satellite with little regard for the ship hanging out in equatorial orbit around the Kerbal's home planet. To keep the narrative simple and not spoil future episodes, it is preferable if you pay it no mind right now either and focus on our mission at hand, which is about to run into its own set of issues. Earlier we talked about comms blackouts, and apparently we only had to wait two launches for one to rear its ugly face during a planned maneuver. That means we couldn't perform our capture burn at the Perimon for our second rover, which of course, without understatement, is problematic. But it will serve to showcase the importance of the Oberth effect, more so than the stock game ever does with its slow delta V requirements. I'd talk about the Oberth effect at length if I wasn't trying to keep these videos condensed and interesting, and also if I didn't know that other people on the internet have already done so several times with way better clarity. If uncertain what the Oberth effect is, go check out Scott Manley, although I'm assuming at least 90% of you already have. The net effect here is that we're spending more delta V to do less. Since we're performing a posigrade or retrograde burn at a slower velocity than we would have had at our perimon. This means we're going to end up in a less tight orbit with our transfer stage and we'll need to spend more delta V to perform our landing. We do have a couple hundred delta V to spare for getting down on the surface, but that is calculating for a perfect hover slam. Landings and launches are of course the occasions where you absolutely don't want to run out of fuel, since doing so means instant mission failure. That's why you always bring some fuel to spare. Well, you either bring spare fuel or spare missions, preferably both. But now, with odds stacked against us, it's time to prepare for our landing attempt. We've waited a couple of orbits to make sure we had communications going for us and at least some sunlight during the descent, but mission control is restless and the command is given. Separating the rover Skycrane from the smart transfer stage is a good start and we'll let the rover gently drift through space side by side with the spent stage for a while before performing the retro burn that will bring it on its one way trip to its final resting spot, in however few pieces we can manage. But again, ill favor strikes our mission, as we lose communications during our drift, which I guess is preferable to losing it during our landing. The cause for this blackout is unknown, as the line indicators provided by remote tech seem to suggest that we should have a connection during these circumstances, but we do not. This is just things to prepare for when dealing with a plethora of mods made only to ever make life harder. So we apply the Microsoft solution. We turn it off, then on again. Well, rather than mucking with the probe, which we have no control over, we're going to switch to the already delivered sister probe and thereby reset the flight scene. And indeed, upon switching to the other rover, it's apparent that the comms are fully functional. We also make sure to activate the Omni Antenna, since acting as a relay is the explicit reason we left this probe in orbit rather than attempt a landing with it. Still, we seemingly should have a connection with Hornbury 2 already without the Omni Antenna extended. So we switch back to verify. And would you look at that, our solution worked and we have a connection with about 936 milliseconds of lag. 
That's good enough for our purposes, so we shall begin our descent to the rocky ways beneath post haste. To begin with, we dump our monopropellant and then quickly realize that may have been a bad idea. Since our gimbals are situated up on the sky crane, which makes up most of the mass of the vehicle, they are also very near the center of mass, meaning they produce very little torque. This would not have been a huge problem if the craft was properly balanced and didn't induce torque on thrust. But this is a vessel with a thrust offset to its center of mass. Through the use of RCS we can correct for it somewhat, but we only have a few meager units of RCS fuel available to us after dumping most of it. Well, it's too late to back out now, so past me decides to try some cheating. As he is wont to do when he feels like the game is throwing curveballs at him he couldn't possibly foresee. But then again, past me is as bad at this game as present me is at baseball, and there are multiple solutions to this issue. The proactive fix would be to use the mod RCS build aid to verify that the center of thrust and center of mass line up, at least enough that the engine gimbals can keep up with the induced rotation. The retroactive solution is that once stuck in this situation, go for spin stabilization. If spinning along the thrust vector, the offset will over time cancel out in all other directions. Sure, the craft would be hellishly difficult to control by any means other than throttle, and the landing would could still have been out of reach, but it's a whole lot better than attempting to scam you out of a proper landing. Now, this design flaw is of course present both on this craft and the Hornbory 1, so we're going to leave the other rover up as a satellite, rather than attempt a landing likely to have the same outcome as this one. To deal with the quite apparent frustration of that failed landing, past me spent some time dealing with other missions for a while afterwards. He made sure to put up that third comm satellite into orbit as to not have to worry about that comm's blackout we experienced when attempting our retro burn capture, and he also put a few tourists into short lasting orbits to make back some of the funds to waste rover mission set us back, so as to afford us a third go where we will have corrected for the spin issue if nothing else. These showcase missions mirror previous ones I've already shown but it wouldn't be fair to not talk about the frustration this game can bring at times. Because as presented, this series is going to more and more transition from a coherent let's play into more of a highlights reel as more and more content turns from interesting new stuff into funds grinding routine. Back in episode 1 I pretty much only cut out the loading screens, now you're watching a 25-ish minute episode cut from probably 30 hours of raw footage. As such, it may be that at times I seem to never fail nor get frustrated since I get so much done in so little time, but I'll just remind you that it's all an illusion of perspective. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying that if you're also trying to progress through this game like I do, the number one thing you'll need is patience. And speaking about patience, it's time we quickly got the Hornbore 3 off the pad and onto the MUN, with the exact interim details cut out for your convenience. After a successful launch and transfer burn, we perform our capture burn as scheduled, which comes as no real surprise with the Galgator Com satellite having completed our three satellite constellation and giving us uninterrupted uptime for any craft in vision of at least one of these data relays. The question is no longer do we have comms to the target, but rather is our target well designed enough to perform the mission as desired. With the assumption that it is, we again expend a sizable chunk of monopropellant to initiate our descent. Because the lower ISP of the RCS thrusters mean we get a higher total delta V by shutting that weight before our main fuel reserves. With our active strategia strategy calling for landings in three different biomes, it is also desirable to put our landing site in a biome we won't accidentally hit with a future rover. 
After such a state has been achieved, it's a matter of waiting until the last possible second to perform our landing burn and hope that everything ends up well. Now, mind you, with the slim funds allotted to us, we can't both bring enough fuel to perform a landing, as well as have that landing go fast, thanks to big powerful engines. Instead, we're utilizing these tiny tweak-scale terriers to bring us safely down to the surface of the moon in no rapid fashion. The idea is to keep our suicide burn counter at zero seconds, indicating that by the time we reach the ground, we'll have killed all of our surface velocity. It's going to be a slow descent, so sit back and enjoy the ride. So we didn't quite nail that landing, but that's the very reason we brought spare wheels. We have, for the first time in Kerbal history, 9 years, 4 months and 3 days after the conception of our space program, landed on the surface of an alien world. And we are greeted with a very desolate view, coupled with oodles of science. In any case, Hornbory 3 has brought upon us a new era in spaceflight and will pave the way for future forays that shall from now not only take us into the void, but through it onto other worlds. But before traversing the void freely to other worlds, the more pressing matter is to bring home the Kerbals who are stuck in that void. But that is a matter for the next episode, and I'll see you guys then.